There we go. I think I've got all the technicalities taken care of. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Focus on Prophecy. Tonight, we are into Revelation 12. It's the conspiracy to murder. It is the war in heaven. Um, tonight, I just want to welcome those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. Always good to have you with us. And of course, we have uh, some people here with us on Zoom as well. And of course, later on in the week, we have people who will be joining us on YouTube. And we're just so glad that, look, folks, all of you, we're so glad that you're here with us. Now, just to take care of a little housekeeping things, remember, uh, folks, uh, I don't know if you're like me, I got to remember to hide my phone and, and turn it off and, um, you know, just create some space for you and make this your time, uh, minimize the disturbances so that you can really focus in on what we're going to learn here tonight. And of course, to just kind of um, get into the word of God and grow there. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at a very uh, famous theme in scripture. Uh, it's the great controversy. And I'm so looking forward to this study tonight. Of course, folks, if you want to comment, for those of you who are on Facebook Live, um, I'm always checking the comment section there. Uh, folks, if you put things with me, if, for those with me on Zoom, if you put things in chat, it might take me just a little bit more uh, to see that. Um, however, just feel free to take the microphones off and, you know, jump in, share, talk, ask your questions. Uh, we always want to make this a safe space for people to be able to ask their questions. And again, we also by, you know, to do that, let's, of course, respect other people's opinions. And it's okay to disagree, but we do so respectfully and lovingly. And uh, again, Welcome, everybody. So good to have you here tonight. Before we start with a word of prayer, I just wanted to mention that tonight as we move into Revelation chapter 12, we're actually shifting what we would call prophetic cycles. Now, the first prophetic cycle was the cycle that focused on Satan and his war with God's church. And we saw this in with the seven churches of Revelation, then the seven seals and the seven trumpets. And, you know, we saw in the seven, um, with the seven churches, God had a warning and he had a um, word of encouragement, uh, counsel and um, direction for the churches. And, um, and again, that was to grow the church. God is invested in the growth and health of his church. And so, uh, again, those seven churches represented seven eras of church history and world history. And this is actually the first prophetic cycle. And um, hi, Debbie, good to have you joining us um, over on uh, Facebook Live. And I see some others have just joined us as well. So the first era has to do, of uh, the first prophetic cycle has to do with the seven eras of church history and world history. And we saw with the seven seals and the seven trumpets um, that God was warning the church. Uh, he was um, warning of judgments. He was warning of an attack on the church. And that war with the church and against the church was the first prophetic cycle. Now we're going into the second prophetic cycle from 12 on. And this is literally the war that took place in heaven. It's the war between Christ and Satan himself. Uh, we call it the great controversy. Uh, scripture refers to it as the war in heaven. And we're again, we're going to focus in on this war in a little bit more. Folks, before we do that, let's start off with a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us tonight. Well, Father God in heaven, Lord, we come to you in Jesus name, asking that you be a part of our study tonight. As always, we are told we're two or three two or three are gathered in Jesus' name. Jesus, you're here. You are with us. Holy Spirit, we can sense your presence. We know that you are eager to teach us about the war in heaven and how this reflects on God's character and what it means for us as a church. So I pray that you would help us to be attentive, engaged, and involved, and that you would reveal to us tonight in this book of Revelations, what it is you want us to know about this war, this great controversy. Uh, this we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. 
Again, everybody, welcome. It is so good to have you here. I'm going to ask you to take out your Bibles if you have them handy. You're going to want them handy tonight. We're going to be looking at uh, the whole chapter of Revelation uh, chapter 12. Again, it focuses in on this war in heaven. And what you need to know is like the first prophetic cycle. The first prophetic cycle began with um, the just after the resurrection of Christ, it was the early church, and it went to the second coming of Jesus. This prophetic cycle begins before the world was even created. This goes back into uh, pre-earth, back before God created us and he created our world. And it spanned from this war in heaven. It comes down to earth and it's going to continue until the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this great controversy, this war, spans the entirety of human history. And again, we Adventists like to call it the great controversy. And what you need to know is that the great controversy stretches far back in time. And long ago, a glorious angel named Lucifer openly rebelled against God. Now, I don't know about you, but I love this guy, his name is C.S. Lewis. I love his writings. He was one of the great defenders of Christianity. And C.S. Lewis was once quoted as saying something similar to the effect of um, anybody who reads the Bible, uh, it becomes immediately clear that God is at war. And tonight we're going to see that this war, once again, it began in heaven. Uh, it was an attack on God's character. It impacted all of heaven. It comes down to earth and it impacts us and it impacts every single human being living on the planet but not just god not just the angels not just our planet but it also impacts what the bible refers to as the unseen worlds so with all of that in mind with this so great a cloud of witnesses in the universe in this chapter we're going to see um again this war and we're going to focus in on it we're also going to see some new symbols tonight well folks i'm going to ask you um some questions here um in bible prophecy what does a baby represent what does the baby in this chapter represent if you maybe studied ahead or read ahead a little there's a woman she's pregnant and she's pregnant with the baby and the dragon can't wait to devour it mm -hmm. What does the baby represent? Jesus. Represents Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, in Bible prophecy, uh, what does the dragon represent? Satan. Satan. Now, in Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? The church. Um, the church or a church. Um, we want to be, be clear here. Okay. In Bible mm -hmm. prophecy, a woman represents a church or a religion um, because there's two kinds of women in Bible prophecy, correct? That's correct. And they both represent religious systems or churches, but now mm -hmm. what would the remnant represent? Because there's a remnant. They would represent God's remnant, true church. Yeah, the true church. Right? Yes. Okay. So folks, we're getting into, again, chapter 12 and um i want us to read the first six verses um of revelation 12 so again verses one through six i'm going to bring them up on the screen if somebody would be willing to read these as i bring them up um that would be wonderful let's start with revelation it's chapter 12 i hope you have your bibles handy let's go to verse one could somebody read this for us please um, okay. Now I can't see the whole screen, but but I'll read from my from the Bible. Okay. Please do. I, do, okay. I only see your pictures and whatnot on the right. Okay. Now a great sign appeared in heaven: a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Okay. Now, folks, I need to ask: Can everybody else see the screen? Like I am sharing the powerpoints here tonight. Yes, I can see it. Okay, abs okay, fantastic. Okay, so verse two, could somebody read that for us? She was pregnant and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. 
Mm, okay. And verse three. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems on his heads. Okay. And verse four, please. His tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman, and she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. This is quite the story, isn't it? Okay, verse, verse five. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Okay, and the last verse, uh, it is verse six. Could somebody read that, please? And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care of her for 1,260 days. Okay, thank you all for reading those verses for us. Now, before we go any further, I want you to, to see how this story isn't exactly a new story, but this is the same story and the same war uh, that's been taking place down through human history. This war began in a garden and it continues um, down through history. So I, wanna, I want you to see the similarities tonight between Genesis chapter 1 and Revelation. Actually, that should be Genesis chapter 3. My apologies. And Revelation 12. I'm going to need to fix this. Again, Genesis 3. Um, in Genesis 3, folks, look at this. In both stories, we have a woman um, who represented God's true people um, before she fell. Eve was you know, God, part of God's true people. We have a serpent or a dragon in both stories. There's deception. Um, um, both women are clothed with light. Um, we have God's children and God's people, and both are waiting for a child. And it's, by the way, the same child. So, so again, this is not a new story. It's the same war, the same story being played out down through human history. Because, um, again, uh, well, here we go. As long as Satan is at war with God, he will always be at war with God's people. That's why this story is being played out down through history. This war was fought, well, basically it was fought in heaven, then it was fought in the garden, and it will be fought until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, Speaking of God's people, uh, let's turn our attention first to the woman who, again, represents, in this case, God's true church. And I wanted to ask you to describe, um, and you're going to have to go back to verse one for this, describe the woman, the church, how she was dressed. Clothed with the sun, and the oh. moon was under her feet. Okay. Anything her, else? Her head had a garland of 12 stars. Okay, that's correct. Clothed with the sun, 12 stars on the head and moon under the feet. A lot of symbology here. Now, folks, what do you think being clothed with the sun represents? The sun would represent Christ's righteousness. Mm. Okay, do we have agreement with that? I agree with that, yes. Okay, we have some consensus on that. Um, folks, always, when we're talking about being clothed in white, robed in white, or with the sun, uh, folks, we are talking about the righteousness of Christ, which is gifted to the church. Uh, mm -hmm. Un un understand that the sun in this passage, if you were to read it into the Greek, is this bright, shining, huge light. Now, you can't be clothed with the actual sun, so we know that this is symbolic in its language, right? Uh, because the sun would kill you, <laughs> literally. So we know it's symbolic in language. And so being clothed in light is always symbolic of being gifted Christ's righteousness because we have no righteousness of our own that would even come close or be even equal 
to the righteousness of Christ himself. He is the source, like the sun is the source of all light. Jesus is the source of all righteousness. Amen. Now, let me ask you, what were Adam and Eve clothed with when they were in the garden? It light. was also, Pastor, with, the, with God's righteousness, he, he, his light that he put, he covered them with. With light. Okay, so you mean to tell me, when I read Uncle Arthur's Bible stories, mm -hmm. and I see Adam and Eve running around, and you know how they've got, they, they, they've got the strategically placed leaves and animals, mm -hmm. um, but if you took away the leaves and animals, they'd be complete, completely naked. You mean to tell me that wasn't actually the case? No, they, they were clothed in light. <laughs> Folks, this is actually the case. Adam and Eve were clothed in the righteousness, the light, robed in God's righteousness. That was their covering. Only yes. when they sinned did they realize, oh, oops, well, we're naked under this light. Um, so notice that righteousness is a light in our lives that only comes from a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus. Adam and Eve had it, and we have currently have it we are gifted christ's righteousness and when we get into heaven we're going to be clothed in christ's light and his righteousness now Amen. that's that's a look at the church again this is god's church because god has gifted to her his righteousness which means that christ is carrying the sins of his people um, he has forgiven them and he has gifted them salvation but now let's turn our attention to this dragon fella. Um, maybe you can fill this in. It's from verse three. And it says that the fiery, fiery red, oh, not read, red. Oh my goodness. I think I was having a dyslexic day that day. I'm going to have to edit that. The fiery red dragon is described as having so many heads, horns, and diadems on its head. Can anybody fill in the blanks? Seven heads. Seven heads. Ten horns. And ten horns, yes. Okay. And how many yes. diadems? Seven. Okay. That's correct. Um, seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on its head. Now, um, going to this next one, Scripture says that stars were thrown to the ground, mm -hmm. that, that it took its tail and, and, and threw um these these stars these angels to the earth how many was it a third one third one third of heaven mm -hmm. now somebody might be wondering why we say that a third of the stars were the angels of heaven a and again we go back to bible prophecy we studied this before where in scripture the stars represent the angels Thank i mean you. even satan himself was once named a morning star yeah. So the stars in scripture represent angels and scripture is telling us because of this war in heaven, one third of the angels also rebelled against the creator. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so, but you got to be wondering how in the world, I mean, think about this, how in the world did Satan manage to convince one third of the angels of heaven? Now think about this, who saw God interacted with God, would have hugged God, worshiped God, mm -hmm. and now Satan convinces a one-third of them that God went from being the good guy to the bad guy? And, and, and maybe you're wondering how he pulled that off? Tonight we're going to see that he did it in the okay. exact same way he pulled that stunt with Eve in the garden. So in the same way that he deceived Eve is the same way he deceived one-third of heaven, and is still in part, it's still a tool or a tactic he still uses today. But we'll get yes. into that in a little bit more. Um, I wanted to go back to, to this. In Revelation 12 and 2, it says that the woman is pregnant with a child. Who is this child? Jesus. Our beloved Savior. Absolutely. It's none other than Christ himself. Now, according to Revelation 12 and 5, what is Christ destined to do? rule all nations to rule over all the nations now we saw this back in daniel chapter two did we not in mm -hmm. nebuchadnezzar's dream what happens at the end of the dream 
There's the statue. The stone. You got, you've got the stone. And it cut out and hit the feet and everything come crumbling down. Right. So the statue, the head of gold, arms of, and you know, arm, arms of silver, uh, the bronze, the iron, the feet of iron and clay all represent nation states. And God's kingdom is going to come. It's going to crush and blow away all those other kingdoms and the kingdom of Christ. And he will, you know, we sing that song and he shall reign forever and ever. Um, and, and he will. His kingdom will be the kingdom that rules over all the nations. Amen. Now, so what is the dragon waiting to do to this child when he is born? To devour it. <coughs> destroy. Okay, absolutely. To devour or to destroy this child. Mm -hmm. Now, did Satan try to destroy Jesus in and around the time of his birth? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, Joseph and Mary had to take off in the middle of the night because an angel said, you know what, you need to go because Herod um, is, is feeling, you know, threatened by the news of this child's birth. And, and what did Herod do? He, ha he, made, he made a law that, that they're to destroy all children below the age of, male children below the age of two. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, can I ask you, where have we heard that tactic before? Where a king is threatened by the birth of children and he orders children ages two and under to be killed. Doreen, I think you were saying it. Yes, uh, with Moses. Yeah, abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, we say God doesn't change. Satan doesn't change either. Uh, he used the same tactics with Moses, who would be the one that God would use to deliver his people out of the bondage in Egypt, right? And so now, now Moses delivered his people out of physical bondage. Jesus is coming to deliver us from spiritual bondage. And Satan used the exact same tactics to try and end the life of both Moses and Jesus. Now, notice that in turn, it's the birth of Jesus that gives birth to the church. Amen. And this is, now this is important because remember um, that, um, that Satan goes to war, not only with God, but always with God's people. Um, mm -hmm. So we have this war in heaven. Um, we have Satan is trying to kill Jesus. He couldn't kill Jesus. So where does he turn his attention to? Um, uh, wh 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 where, where does, where, where's he going to, turn his focus and this brings his us people yeah this brings us so if he can't get jesus he's going to go after people. the his church people. so mm -hmm. let me ask according to verse six what happened to christ's true church it the true church fled and they had to flee into the wilderness for refuge right and that was because of persecution so it fled into the wilderness. The dragon wants to destroy the church and it has to go into hiding now. Now, so that we can help again, un help us understand what time period of earth's history this is, this major war, this huge attack on God's true church. Um, wanted to ask for how many years was the church in the wilderness? 1260 years. Oh, folks, where have we heard that before? Yeah. Right? Where have we seen this number before? There's a clue here in the picture. Right? This time period belongs to the period of the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. This is when the church became corrupted or it became apostate. This is the time prophecy that belongs to both the Little Horn Power and the beast power of revelation. And we're really going to see that more in the next study. Um, but please take my word for it. This is the little horn power. This is the mm -hmm. beast power of revelation. And we know that from our study on Daniel chapter seven, that the little horn power is known by another name today. What would we call this power today? The papacy. Yeah, the papacy. This is papal Rome. And we know that in 538 AD, they came into power. Justinian, the emperor, transfers his civil power to the church, and, and the church is given absolute power and 
We know absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, and we know when that power ended. When did the power end? It began in 538 AD. When was the power broken? 1798. 1798. We're getting the numbers down now. That's fantastic. <laughs> and during that 1260 year period, during the Dark Ages, we know that Papal Rome persecuted anybody who opposed its false gospel of salvation, its gospel of works, um, all of the traditions, the, uh, the pagan influences, the idol worship. So notice, again, we want to focus in on this because this is going to become huge in the next two studies, that the little horn power of Daniel 7 and this beast power of uh, 12 and 13 coming up and in, in, in other chapters, it's the same power that goes to war not only with God himself, but with God's people. Now, there's also another description that God uses. We have the little horn, we have um, the beast, but there's another symbol, very similar to the woman that Revelation uses to describe this religious political power. Do you know what that symbol is? The impure church. Yes, which is represented by a very specific kind of woman. Um, harlot. A harlot, yes. a, a prostitute, right? Mm -hmm. Now, remember yes. in Bible prophecy that women represent churches, and you're going to see coming up that the little horn and the beast power um, are also represented as, as a prostitute, which represents a false system of religion. And so Satan's false system of religion, the little horn, the beast, this prostitute, because it prostituted itself to keep its power, is at war with God. What started out as God's church is now at war with God and God's people. And so this corrupted apostate Christianity, this former church of God, is now going to do to God's people what pagan Rome used to do to it. You see what, how sin can twist us? Mm -hmm. You see what happens when we fall from God? How, how dark it gets? So um, here's what we need to know. Satan is at war with God, and therefore Satan's false church will always be at war with God's true church. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, we're going to um, shift now a little bit more our focus and we're going to be moving now to verses 7 through 12. We're not going to read them on screen um, like we did before for the sake of time. But if you have your Bibles handy, uh, we're going to be referring to them. And so we'll refer to the verses and you can take a look and answer the uh, upcoming questions. Mm -hmm. Folks, in verse 7, who was involved in the war in heaven? Michael and his angels. Jeez. Okay, and Michael and his angels. And, and the dragon. And, and the angels. dragon. Okay. So we have Michael and his angels versus Satan and his angels. Now, let me ask you, who's Michael? Michael. None other than Jesus. Jesus. None other than Jesus. Now, um, if you're questioning who that is and why we say Michael is, because we thought, isn't Jesus Jesus? Uh, folks, we need to understand that the term Michael, the archangel, um, there's only one archangel in scripture. And if you go back to our study on Daniel chapter seven, um, you will see, uh, especially as you get into Daniel 10, 11, and 12, that it identifies Michael, the archangel, is actually Messiah, the prince. And there's only Amen. one Messiah in all of scripture, and his name is Jesus. So Amen. understand that Michael is a title that is given to Christ as he is the commander in chief of the angels. In the same way, the president of the United States is called the commander in chief of the armies of the U.S., even though he's not a soldier or one day maybe she. Uh, but you get the point. So let me ask you, what names are given to the dragon in these verses? There are two very devil common and ones. Satan and Satan, devil and Satan. Right. Satan and devil or devil and Satan. Now, the, now, why is, again, 
notice how the Bible interprets itself. We have a dragon, and then Revelation goes out of its way to make sure that we understand who the dragon is. And the dragon is none other than Satan himself. But I wanted to ask, does Satan, does the Bible have any other names um, for Satan um, in Scripture? Can you think of some of the other names he's given? Lucifer. Lucifer. Mm -hmm. The old serpent. The old serpent, yes. Can you think of any others? I've got a list of them, and you're going to go, oh, right, yes, you're going to remember them. <laughs> Lucifer, which means morning star, um, Beelzebub, liar, thief, serpent, enemy, roaring lion. Now, I, I want you to notice something, that before the fall of Satan, he was called Lucifer, and mm -hmm. that's a morning star which means that he, more than any other angel, reflected the true righteousness and character of God. Yes. Oh, yes, Eunice, deceiver, father of lies. I got to add those. Yes. I'm going to put those in, Eunice, right after this. But notice, before he falls, he's the morning star, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and now, we now refer, refer to Jesus as the bright and morning star. We sing about that. But this morning star, the role of the morning star, which was the role of Jesus on earth, was to reflect and to show on a, you know, everybody else what the righteousness and, and character of God looks like. He was, the, of, of, of the angels, Lucifer was the greatest reflection of God's character of love. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for inviting others to experience the wonder of the glory of God. Now, notice that after his fall, that his name now is associated with darkness, evil, and the destruction of others. So, Scripture says he deceived one-third of heaven, and they've been down here on earth. Uh, in verse 9, and it says, so that Satan and his angels were cast down to earth. Folks, what have they been doing here since they've been here? Are they... Um, vacationing on some beach, having coconut milk and uh, uh, surfing. W what are they up to down here? Doing lots of damage. Doing lots of damage? Dis yeah. Destruction of people. Okay. And also, yeah, some of the destruction on earth is um, unfortunately comes from him. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and folks, I agree with all of that. But mm -hmm. his chief aim is this, deceiving the whole world. Yes. Yes. And, and so this causes me to ask, how in the world is he deceiving the whole world? Think about that for a moment. How is it that Satan himself is managing to deceive an entire planet of people? We're, we're close to what now? Eight billion people? Like we passed mm -hmm. the seven billion mark. I think we're um, heading forward. Yes, Debbie, he is prowling around like a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, he knows his time is short. Folks, the way Satan is doing this, and it's the same way he did it to the angels in heaven, and it's the same way yes. he did it with Eve. He changed their picture of okay. God. Yeah. Here's the one, the morning star, who reflected the glory and the righteousness and the character of God more than any other angel. A and then... Um, and then all of a sudden he turns around and he goes to war with God. And, and what's the first thing he has to attack? Other people's pictures of God. Um, Eunice, I agree. They were trying to prove that God is not who he claims to be. So that is an attack on what? If you want to prove that somebody is not who they claim to be, you're attacking what? Their character. Their character. Char character and reputation. Now, where do I get this from? Is this just my opinion and I have a theory and I'm, you know, a dog chewing on a bone? Because I know I talk about this, this issue of God's character a lot. This is where we get the, this idea from that it's an attack on God's character, who he is, his law, his justice, his kingdom, his right to rule, these elements of the great controversy. We get it from the word itself, war 
which means polemus. Now, when you hear war in heaven, how do you think the war was fought, folks? Psychological. Psychological warfare? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying uh, it wasn't fought with bows and arrows? Nope. I, I, I liked one time Amazing Facts um, did a, a, a video, and it was a war in heaven, and, and the angels were up there fighting with swords that looked a little like lightsabers. Um, <laughs> So no, well, what this this word war polemus, it's the root word for our words for politics or propaganda. In other words, it wasn't fought with bows and arrows, slings and spears, or missiles and fighter jets or atomic we weapons. Yes, it was fought mentally. A in other words, um, this was a political war. And and folks, how do politicians fight each other? With words. With Accusing words. Wrongly. <laughs> yeah, right. We call it mudslinging, right? What's mudslinging designed to do? Change the way you see the political opponent. Opponent, because mm -hmm. if I can change the way you see somebody, hopefully I can change the way you behave towards them. And, and this is what Satan managed to do. We don't know how long it took him in heaven. But he managed to change the way the angels saw God, who in their picture, in their mind, God went from being good and holy and just and righteous to being unfair and unjust. And that's when they rebelled, only when their picture of God changed. And then we have Eve. How was it that Satan convinced Eve to rebel against God? That what God said, he didn't mean it that way. Okay. In, in part, yes, absolutely. We know that he challenged her understanding of God's word, but ultimately, did he not change the way Eve saw God? Yeah, that they yeah. could be wise like God. Yeah, Eve, you know, exactly, Eunice, doubt in God's intentions towards us. George R. Knight said that one of the things sin did to us was that it intrinsically gave us a mistrust of God's intentions towards us. Before the fall, God's intentions were good, they were noble, and they were pure. Um, but Eve fell because she be doubted God's intentions towards her. What do you, what mm -hmm. do you mean we're not going to die? Oh, you mean God lied? Like, like oh, what? If I eat the fruit, I can become God and God's been holding out on me? So before she fell, God was good, the tree was bad. And also before she fell, what led her to fall was that her mind changed. And maybe this was her greater sin when the tree became good and God became bad. Mm -hmm. And this is the tactic all along. It is so critically important that we make sure that in this great controversy that we have the right picture of God and that we reflect the correct picture of God to all the world. And this was Jesus' mission. He said, I have come to show you who the Father is, right? And th that's what he told us. And he said, if you see me, you see the Father. And, and I want for our church, I want for the Advent people, as a part of our Advent message, that the world will see Jesus correctly through us. Okay, so moving along, according to verse 11. How do the followers of Jesus receive victory over Satan? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Okay. And, and, is, the, and is there another part to that in your... Yes, uh, by, by the word of their testimony. And by the word of their testimony. Um, through the blood of the lamb and their testimony. Folks, what's their testimony about? During my experience with the Lord himself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus. Yes, Eunice. And, and so this is our testimony. Um, we're mm -hmm. saved. It's, our testimony is about the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. the salvation of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ's ability to forgive and remove our sin and gift us his righteousness. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so here's the thing. The cross is the ultimate revelation of God's character of love. Mm 
And, and this mm -hmm. is how we have the victory over Satan and his deception, because we have the correct picture of God. We know who God is. You won't be able to shake us from God because we're so in love with God, because we know God is love. And so in the end, God's going to have an end time people who would rather die than sin against him or betray him because their testimony is this is our God. Yes. This is who our God is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, this is why I believe Sister White says that the last message of mercy mm -hmm. to go to a dying world is the revelation of God's character of love as it is revealed through God's people. This is our mm -hmm. testimony. This is who God is. Now, the Bible talks about two trees. I wanted to share this with you. One resulted in our fall. And the other resulted in our salvation. And Satan tries to deceive us. But the truth, folks, it will always set us free. Praise God. I want to just dive a little. I'm looking at the time. We still have a little time left. Just want to dive into the last part of this war in heaven. Folks, we're now going to shift our attention to verses 13 through 18, which will take us to the end of the chapter. And... Uh, so again, continuing this war in heaven, it tells us that for 1260 years, God's people would be persecuted for their faith. Now, again, folks, what time period of Earth's history is this covering? The 1260. Which is we call in history, world history, this would be? The Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. Now, what symbolic term does John use to describe God's rescue of his church from this persecution. It, that she was given two wings. Absolutely. It was given two, two wings. Um, now, so in scripture, wings represent speed uh, or swiftness. And this happened during the time when God's church went underground to hide from papal Rome and its persecution. Now, here's the good news. The church survived. Amen. Because <laughs> yes. we're here today, right? Yes. I mean, yes. this is the good news. The church <laughs> survived. Um, but after the fall of papal Rome in 1798, as we get into the 19th century and the 1800s, there's a great spiritual revival. And, and only because the church survived. And its testimony becomes even louder and clearer as God's people start getting into the word, understanding Bible prophecy. The gospel is returning to the world. And there's this great revival that's going to be taking place around the world. And we're going to be looking at that in three weeks' time. Um, so you want to come back and, and, and be a part of that study. Now, here's the thing. Papal Rome loses its power in 1798. In the 1800s, the Ottoman Empire falls, and um, and and the the opposition of the Muslims um, has ceased, and gospels taking off, and uh, there's great revival and great understanding of the scriptures. And I wanted to ask: Do you think Satan said, "Okay, that's it. I lost. Give up the church. No. You won." No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in anger and frustration, whom does Satan attack next? Mm -hmm. And it's in scripture. God's, God's his church. His church? Yeah. Okay. His people. His people. God's um, people. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of? Well, the remnant. Yeah, the rest of the woman's offspring. We would use the word we would use, that's correct, uh, Carolyn, is the word remnant. It is what is left, right? It's the remainder. And what rem so, but okay. So, who are this remnant? Who are the offspring? What is Bible? Now, the Bible is very specific in identifying who these people are. Who are the offspring? They have the testimony of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy. And what else? They're doing they something the else. They keep the commandments of God. Right? 
And specifically in these verses, it is those who keep the commandments of God. And yes, those other characteristics as well. They've got the spirit of prophecy. They have um, the testimony. Um, These are people preaching the word. But most importantly, they are true to what scripture teaches, especially in including the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments also are a revelation of God's character of love. Now, folks, how do we know that? How do we know that the commandments are a reflection of God's character of love? What, 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 what are the first four designed to teach us about love? Yeah. Love so, to God. Love to God. God loves and yes. love for mankind. And a love for mankind, right? Mm-hmm. The royal law. Love God with all your heart, heart. mind, soul. and soul. soul. And and the second part of the royal law is what? To love, love your fellow man as yourself. as yourself. Right? This is how we know that the commandments are a revelation of God's character of love. So those who keep God's commandments do so out of what? Love. Love. And as they do so, they're living a life of love. And that life of love becomes a revelation of God's character of love in the world. Now, how do you think Satan feels about that revelation in the world? Now, think about this. It used to be his job to reveal God's character of love. And now he's been replaced by what? Replaced by God's people. By God's people. Mm-hmm. Right? So God's last day church are believers who remain faithful in their love relationship with christ and as they do they reflect his character of love and folks this is going to become important um, in our next two um, studies um, as we continue on and we look at the mark of the beast what the mark of the beast is all about and who again focusing in on god's end time people and their faithfulness to jesus and and how critically important um god's name and how god's name is uh connected to his character of love and how important it is to have that name and that character re uh, that name on our foreheads and that character reproduced in our life that's the studies coming up in the next two weeks folks i i thank you for being a part of this tonight um as we close out as always we like to have a little quiz and so tonight i wanted to just ask you a couple of questions um before we go into the quiz, or maybe I should ask this before we go into the quiz. Folks, are there any questions about anything we talked about here tonight? It's pretty clear to me. Okay, pretty clear, pretty straightforward. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, folks, maybe for some it is, maybe for some it's not. Um, Again, if you have any questions about this, maybe you don't want to ask them in public. Maybe you want to privately. Uh, Folks, you can do that. You can instant message me. Um, You can message me on Facebook. You can text me. Some of you, you have my email address. Please feel free to ask questions. I love questions. So I have some questions for you, and they are true or false. (laughs) Don't you love that segue uh, there, Sarah? (laughs) Hey, you you know, I I do my best. Folks, I I love being with you. I love the humor. I love our laughter. I love the sharing. I love the fellowship. And I thoroughly enjoy my time with you on Wednesday nights. And and I know I pray for you and I pray for our time together. Folks, true or false questions coming up. And I wanted to ask, true or false, in Revelation 12, the great red dragon represents Russia. (laughs) No, false. (laughs) Some of you are laughing. Okay, it's not Russia. Okay. No, of course not. The great red dragon, notice I spelled it correctly this time, is none Mm. other than um, Satan himself. And the Bible always uses the image of serpent and dragon to represent Satan himself. Next, true or false, the war between good and evil on earth had its beginning in a war that began in heaven. That's right. True. True? Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Today we call this war the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And folks, it is the greatest war in all of human history. As a matter Mm -hmm. of 
Sure. Okay. So next, and, and yes, I'm following, I'm watching you on Facebook as well. Uh, you're getting it right along with us. Folks, let's try this one. True or false, God's people overcome Satan and his temptations by the blood of the lamb. Amen. True. Amen. Yeah. yeah. We'll take the amen as the true. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. folks. Look, on our own, we cannot defeat Satan. We can't even produce an ounce of actual clean righteousness on our own. Sure. Scripture says our righteousness is like filthy rags. Mm -hmm. So we are dependent on Christ for all victory over sin, ourselves, mm -hmm. and even Satan himself, especially Satan himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, our next one, true or false? Revelation 12 pictures a period of 1260 years. That's 538 to 1798 AD when Satan and his false system of religion were per would persecute God's true church. True. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. And oh, by the way, Thando, it's good to see you here tonight along with uh, some of the others. That's fantastic. Yes, that is true. Satan is at war with God and therefore God's church. And those who follow Satan will always fight against God and his people, especially to the very bitter end. Mm -hmm. Folks, uh, and we're going to see how that even goes even after uh, the thousand year period, but that's another Bible study. Okay, God, uh, true or false, God's faithful last day people will be keeping all but one of the Ten Commandments because papal Rome had the authority to change the Sabbath to Sunday. Absolutely not. False. false. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was the strongest response I think we have ever gotten to any question. <laughs> You're awake. You are with me tonight. Okay, <laughs> folks, I would have to agree with that one. That is false. God's end time people will love God more than they love their own lives and will keep all Amen. the commandments, including the true Sabbath. Amen. Folks, you are so much fun. I, I love you all. Um, there's four things tonight I want us to remember before we go. There is a battle raging on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Satan and his angels lost the war in heaven, mm -hmm. and they will lose and they and they will lose the one on earth. Sorry. Again, I gotta go back and edit that. They will lose the one on earth. God has always mm -hmm. had a people who are faithful to him. And Jesus always gives us the victory over Praise Satan, God. sin, and ourselves. So, folks, one last thought. Your response. There is a battle being fought over good and evil. And which side of the battle do you want to be on? God's side. On God's side. That is my prayer. That is my prayer. Folks, it has been a wonderful evening being here with you tonight. Um, again, next week, we're going to continue looking at this great controversy war. We're going to be getting into Revelation chapter 13. And mm -hmm. we all know that this one is the one concerning the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see what we're going to actually next week identify what the mark of the beast is by first identifying what it means to have God's name written on our foreheads, mm -hmm. because that mark is the opposite of what God's name and his seal is. Mm -hmm. And so I want to invite you to come out and be a part of that study next week. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, folks, as usual, any um, praises, any prayer requests for us tonight? Yes, I have to give you praise, my neighbor son. Yes. Job. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. <laughs> And, and I want to thank you for all your prayers for my surgery. Thank you very much. Amen. Yes. You're welcome. I re it was very successful. Praise oh, God. amen. Mm -hmm. We praise God for that. Absolutely. Any others? Uh, yes. I just want to praise God for his enduring love towards us here on planet Earth. Mm. And I thank him that he is 100% available and with the to Amen. moving forward whatever is done for him it is not by our might or by our power but yeah. by his Holy Spirit and we need to bear that in mind because it's so easy for any of us 
to take the glory to ourselves and there's no glory to man. No. And oh. I praise God that he's able to keep us in the right path. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And, and I, I'm, thank, go I ahead. thank God for these wonderful Bible studies. Amen. Yes. God is good. Yes. He yeah. absolutely is. And I'm seeing on <laughs> Facebook, we want to give praise that people are back to work. Amen. Right? Because that was, oh, wow. I mean, that, that, that was tough for people. And we're going to pray for Galena and Yermila. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I have a request as well, please. Yes. Jay. Um, we have um, a sister or, or a, uh, a woman that we've gone to the nursery just next to our house. Um, her sister, uh, Marise, uh, is, uh, has cancer come back. So we want to pray for her. And uh, for Elise, uh, the woman herself as well, because um, she's having some uh, health challenges. So Marise and Elise. Correct. Okay. So it's a, a question. Is that the Maris that we know Elise calling? No, no. Oh, oh okay. This would be Jay's next door neighbor. Oh, okay, okay. I'd, I'd like you to pray for um, a friend's uh, brother, uh, Mohammed, who has cancer and it has metastasized and he is young. Oh. And um, I'd also like you to pray for Lynn, who has an arterial blockage in her good eye. Okay. And oh, if you can uh, also accommodation for Louise um, and her family so that they'll be able to stay in Carlton Place because they've been coming to church. Okay. So, wow. Wonderful. Really okay. Like Absolutely. I love that God is growing uh, Carlton. That is fantastic. Yes, it is. Um, folks, I, I want to pray for uh, people who are engaged in Bible studies. Uh, we also have people engaged in counseling, and, and I want to pray for them. I, I want to pray for uh, Nepean for this Sabbath as the ministry leaders come together and, and we bring our ministry plans for the coming you know, rest of this year and next year, and I'm excited about that. And as we look at how to make more room for people at our church, again, praising God for what he does in and through our churches love God for that. Amen. Folks, we have a number of items for prayer tonight. Um, and okay, Debbie, I see that for peace. Um, and Debbie, been praying for you. Um, um, and please keep us posted on, on what is happening with you and your situation. Um, again, much prayer is going up for you. Folks, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Oh, Father God in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful, as was said here tonight, for your enduring and endearing love. The God you would love us. Um, it, it is, it, as David said, who are we that you will even think about us, let alone become so personally invested in our salvation and well-being? Mm -hmm. Oh, tonight, Lord, we recognize that the only salvation we have is found in you, Jesus and tonight as we studied you and we learned that it is through your sacrifice that our sins are forgiven and removed and lord for the forgiveness and removal of our sins we pray that you would cover us in your robes of righteousness that you would continue to gift us your innocence your righteous holy life and that lord it would sanctify us so that your love is reflected in and through everything we do. And as we come closer to the end of time, we pray that we truly would be a commandment keeping people whose testimony mm -hmm. is the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, tonight, we give praise, Lord, for uh, a neighbor's son who found a job. We prayed for that, and we're so happy for him. Um, mm -hmm. Lord, we're thankful, praising you that Carolyn's surgery went so well. She's on the mend. We can hear joy in her voice and happiness. We're so happy she's back with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And Lord, uh, we do give thanks for these Bible studies. 
We mm. give thanks for what we're learning, for mm -hmm. the revelation of Jesus and Father, the Trinity and the love of God for us in the book of Revelation. And thank you for the warnings and admonitions and the blessings and the hope that we find in this book. Lord, we're so thankful that people are returning. They're getting back to work. We're getting back to uh, normal as much as we can, Lord. And we thank you that we're back to work. We're back to worship. We're back to being able to fellowship with, with each other and celebrate with each other. And Lord, I uh, want to thank you for all the people who are having anniversaries and birthdays and babies being born. And just for the fact that we can celebrate life and now have the ability to have an income to support not only just our lives, but your work in the world. And Lord, we pray for your work in the world. Lord, we think of Yarmila and Galena, Maurice and Elise, uh, Muhammad, Lynn, uh, Lord, folks who are battling with cancer and heart blockages and, and um, issues with their eyes, Lord, in heaven. You are the great physician, and we pray that you would come alongside these people and put your healing hands on them, that you would guide and direct their doctors and their surgeons, Lord, that they would have the skill and the discernment to apply their education, their skill to these is situations. And Lord, if there are things that these individuals could learn along the way that would uh, empower their healing and recovery, that God, somebody would come alongside them and, and guide them in uh, lifestyle issues as well, where, Lord, that is a concern and an issue as well. You know all these things. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we're praying for Louise and family for a place for them to live, an affordable place. Lord, they've been attending Carlton Place Church, and we're praising you that Carlton Place is seeing an influx of people after COVID. God, Lord, this is a great sign. We Amen. pray that you would bless Carlton Place, this pastor and the people, and that, God, they would be a light in their community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of lights in the community, we also pray for Nepean. Lord, this weekend, ministry teams and leaders are getting together and we're going to talk about ministry and we're going to put together a plan that involves growing us as members of our church and inviting other people who don't know Jesus to come and follow him as well. We pray, Lord, that as we navigate to the issues of how to make room for all the growth and the people who are coming. Lord, it's your church. We are your people. We pray that your presence would be felt among your churches, mm -hmm. that God, you would give us direction and a heart to follow mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. and to respond to what it is you were doing in mm -hmm. and through our churches. Yes. Lord, we love you. We give you praise. We adore you. We honor you. We uplift the name of Jesus, thanking you, Holy Spirit, for the revelation of Jesus. Mm -hmm. to us so please keep teaching us so we can become like him in his name we pray uh, amen. Amen. amen amen well thank you so much we praise god we praise him for the peace he gives us debbie so glad that you're in, enjoying peace right now um uh, given your circumstances i mean what a gift from god folks mm -hmm. that is our study for tonight thank you all for coming out being a part of the study. God bless. We'll see you hopefully next week as we get into the Mark of the Beast. Take care, everybody. Ask about, thank thank you. you. Please God bless. give me one minute with you, please. Okay, let me shut down okay. some of the, uh, the tech stuff and we'll do that. Thank you.